Jason, thank you very much. It's uh, good to be here in New York. And I'm going to be talking about the uh, One Belt, One Road. Uh, I'm going to emphasize the Bering Strait Tunnel, but I'm also going to overlap some uh, with the uh, uh, previous speaker who spoke about Latin America. The uh, Lynn and the Rouge political movement, the Schiller Institute, has been really instrumental in first promoting the Eurasian land bridge concept and finally the world uh, rail network, the interconnection of infrastructure through all the continents of the world and to all the countries of the world. And it's very important that uh, their, their role has been one of publicizing this going back many years. And I've been involved with the organization since 1991. And these, some of these early maps, and especially that early report, I, I helped them uh, put together. The Eurasian land bridge is really the concept by which the entire program can come together. You've, of course, seen this in some of the previous uh, presentations today. And especially uh, going from Skovorodino on the Trans-Siberian Railway through Yakutsk and uh, Chukotka to the Bering Strait at a place called Ulan at the, e at the eastern end of the region of Chukotka across from the Bering Strait in Wales, Alaska. And I have been in both places uh, previously. Thank, thank you. Now, there's an extensive network already in place in both Europe and Asia for rail. And the Trans-Siberian Railway, which was completed in the early 1890s over the strong opposition of the British financial interests, interestingly enough, because they didn't want it to interfere with their um, maritime domination. And William Engdahl, who's been associated with the Lyndon LaRouche political movement, has written a number of books, including some recently, Anglo-American Oil Politics and the New World Order. He said this is why World War I was started, to prevent French, American, and Russian interests from building the Bering Strait Tunnel as a matter of background. The next few, please. The Chinese, the Russians, and increasingly throughout Asia and Europe, there is now a network of railroads across the Eurasian land mass, both conventional speed and high speed, both diesel and electric, and a very limited amount of steam in places in China and India, but almost entirely diesel and electric now. There are a series of uh, rail, northern, central, and southern corridors that are in the process or have already been developed. Cargoes have moved to Istanbul from China. They've moved from Germany and England to China, to and from. And also the Russians and the Chinese are working on actually building a high-speed rail line along the present Trans-Siberian Railway between Moscow and Beijing, uh, crossing the border into China at Manzuli in the uh, Inner Mongolian Autonomous Region. At, and also, there is a proposal to going across Mongolia. Uh, there is extensive uh, effort now to develop a high-speed rail line between Moscow and Kazan, southeast of Moscow, into Kazakhstan, which would then go ultimately to Beijing, basically following the uh, existing Eurasian Land Bridge Corridor. And there is a modification of that route, which actually would come through Central Asia, through Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan into Iran, and then to Turkey. And there have been cargoes already going along that route. Next row, please. This uh, diagram showed up in the original 1997 report on the Eurasian land bridge becoming the world land bridge. And looks like I had something to do with that. I'm extremely pleased to see uh, the presentation this afternoon about what's happening in, in Latin America. That's very important because it's need, there was a need to collect, connect North America and South America. And believe it or not, from the time of President Lincoln through President McKinley, there was an effort by the US Army Corps of Engineers to actually begin the work. And they developed the plans to building the railroad even before the Panama Canal was built. But it got stopped. 
and that was very unfortunate. And this is when the revolution took place in Colombia, where Panama was broken off. Um, and also, the, as was just discussed earlier, there's really a, a network that's now being proposed in South America uh, to connect the countries. And interestingly enough, Uruguay, Argentina, Brazil, Chile, and Peru have all either said they're going to join the Eurasian Land Bridge and the One Belt, One Road program, or they are already on board. But to do that, there has to be a connection between South America and North America, which will cross into Asia at the Bering Strait. Next few piece. The Linda the Rouge political movement, the Schiller Institute, Executive Intelligence Review, the New Silk Road becomes the World Land Bridge. This was the model, this was the ideological background for how and why this system and this network should be built to connect railroads throughout the world. Next slide, please. Believe it or not, Russia proposed a highway from London to New York through the Bering Strait, basically following the Trans-Siberian Railway where it was built, other railroads, and then going from Norm and Fair Nome and Fairbanks, Alaska, through Chicago to New York. And that was, was set as a railroad or a, a highway, but it also included a railroad. And that even proposed a bridge across the Bering Strait. I'll discuss that later, and maybe that's not the best mode to go through the Bering Strait because of the weather. Next slide. In the early spring of 2013, I received, or excuse me, early 15, 2015, I received a call from a reporter at the Atlantic Monthly Magazine that said they wanted to do an article about this super highway, super railroad through the Bering Strait between Russia and the United States. I was interviewed, uh, a mining engineer in Alaska by the name of Fyodor Solovyu and Mr. Vladimir Yakunin, who was then the president of the Russian Railway, were all interviewed and we were all quoted as saying this was a concept that needed to be turned into an implementation where it would actually happen. Uh, it was published in July of 2015. Uh, the only public acknowledgement that I personally ever received was about Two weeks later, I got a call from uh, KIRO Radio in Seattle who interviewed me, and then absolutely nothing happened. And it was very obvious that there were people who didn't want this out in the open. Next view, please. Now, several years ago, when, when I, I actually did a feasibility study of building a railroad between Alaska and the lower 48, and my project sponsor said, well, look, I want you to look at the Bering Strait Tunnel. I want you to look at traffic going to Russia, China, and India. And it was not on the emphasis of the railroad physical facilities as much as it was, what was it going to haul? Because if you couldn't answer that question, you were never going to build the railroad. And one of the paintings that came out of this was a conception of what the eastern end of the proposed Bering Strait Tunnel would look like. And it was, I commissioned the rail artist, Craig Thorpe, to do this painting. And at the time I was doing this feasibility study for the Canadian Arctic Railway Company based in Vancouver and British Columbia, and their past proposed passenger train color scheme would be on the, the left. And in the center was a Russian locomotive from the Russian railway with carrying empty tank cars of oil. And the third was a container train carrying containers from the United States to China. And if and when this railroad was, a tunnel was ever built, the majority of the vast majority of this traffic would go between the United States and China through Russia. Next, please. The Bering Strait Tunnel is, would be probably 65 to 70 miles long. Uh, where it's built, the water is between 160 and 180 feet deep. There's limestone and granite 
rock below. It's okay for building tunnels. There's not much seismic activity in that particular area. There may be some artificially created environmental obstacles put in the way, but it's certainly something that can be done. You have native organizations on both sides of the Bering Strait in Chukotka, and you also have the native corporations in Alaska. And their attitude is, well, as long as we benefit, this is a good idea. Now, there's another infrastructure issue we have to deal with, and that's down not too far from Vancouver. It's called the Fraser River Canyon. It goes between Kamloops and Hope, British Columbia. And if any of you have ever driven across Highway 1, across the western part of Canada, you'll drive right up through the middle of the Fraser River Canyon. And it's very steep on both sides, and it's got two tracks, one on one side of the river and one on the other side of the river, the Fraser River. And if you're going to build another railroad, you're not going to put it on the existing tracks because, first of all, they're carrying 120 to 140 trains a day, and secondly, it's designed for slow freight trains, not fast passenger trains. So we'd have a fairly major project, probably between a 65 and an 85 mile long viaduct, to which the Chinese have become experts at building. But we also have to build the West Coast Corridor, and that goes between Vancouver and San Diego and Tijuana, through Seattle, Portland, San Francisco Bay Area, and Los Angeles to San Diego. Now, we have an interior route, through the Central Valley, through Oregon, Washington, it basically gets along the existing corridor. But you do have a need to uh, go through the San Joaquin Valley, but that isn't where people are, and we would need a new line along Highway 101 through the northwestern part of California, from Grants Pass, Oregon, down to San Francisco, through Del Norte, Humboldt, Mendocino, Sonoma, and Marin counties, including a tunnel under San Francisco Bay into San Francisco from Sausalito or from uh, San Rafael. Now, uh, California is already has a uh, high-speed rail system that actually some of the initial parts are under construction. Uh, there has been a great deal of opposition expressed by the Republican delegation in California. In fact, they asked the Secretary of Transportation not to fund the electrification of the commuter rail line between San Francisco and San Jose so they could stop the high-speed rail from being built. Now, this is at the same time President Trump is proposing that we spend money on infrastructure. Uh, sounds like our dots aren't getting connected too well. My own personal feeling is you probably need more than one north-south route between the Bay Area and Sacramento, south to Southern California. Next slide. What do you need to build? Well, we have another tunnel besides the Bering Strait Tunnel, and that's the one under the grapevine. Grapevine is a grade that goes from south of Bakersfield at a place called Grapevine, right at the southern end of the San Joaquin Valley, right up to the top of Tone Pass at 4,000 feet from 1,000 feet. And that would be a 32-mile long tunnel. It would be based on the Gothard Base Tunnel that's just been finished in Switzerland under St. Gothard Pass. And it would have three to four tracks, and it would be able to handle intermodal trains, because you have anywhere from 20 to 25,000 trucks a day going over Interstate 5 between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. And you would also perhaps, I have a new painting that was done afterwards, which has the official California high-speed rail colors, and it also shows an oil train. Believe it or not, the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad back in 2001 expressed an interest in building this exact same project, but they decided not to do it at the time. Next view, please. Now, at the other end of California, and I think those of you that are familiar with Interstate 5 driving up in Northern California see Mount Shasta. And uh, next to that is the uh, Volcanic Peak, and uh, Black, Butte, Black Butte is called. And the proposal would be to build a railroad line, have a high-speed maglev line along with Interstate 5, uh, I'm going to have Craig doing a, a modification of this painting at some time where we, we actually have a, a new color scheme with one of the high-speed trains is the California High-Speed Rail and the other one is the Washington, Oregon Cascades, plus the two freight tracks for Union Pacific and BNSF. But whether that's going to happen or not uh, remains to be seen. Next view, please. 
Now, shifting south, this is the Darien Gap, which is a swamp region at the far southern end of Panama, and the uh, Pan American Highway has about a 100-mile gap in far northwestern Colombia and far southeastern Panama uh, through the Tumorondo Swamp. And my own feeling is you should run a line along the east side where it shows white, it's outside of that national park zone, which was created basically through the British George Soros efforts to make sure we didn't have any connections between North and South America, and have that go over to a place called Turbo over on the east side of, Uri of the Gulf of Uraba, which is that uh, water place between Colombia and Panama, and then it would go south, and then you go up into mountains, and then you would go down through Ecuador and Peru and connect with the previous proposal that's been presented this afternoon. Next slide. This is one of the ideas for the northern route for, as the previous speaker spoke, uh, on the uh, rail between Santos and Brazil or Rio de Janeiro and Ilo, Peru. And of course, there's another proposal across Bolivia. And then south of there, there is a proposal for a rail tunnel under the Andes Mountains between Mendoza and Argentina and Valparaiso in Chile. Also, I want you to know that that is exactly the area where the Naquin oil field is. And that's a shale oil field, very similar to the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, with very similar amounts of oil that could be very well developed. And maybe that would be another reason to build a tunnel to haul oil. So with the map, that shows you uh, uh, what a, a proposed rail network in South America would be that we could grow. And next view, if there's another one. And I also did an extensive feasibility study of building a rail network in Central and Southern Africa. And its purpose would be to connect the Congo with South Africa, both to bring electricity from the proposal for a large 45,000 megawatt dam on the lower Congo River between Kinshasa and the uh, Atlantic Ocean. And the Congo River is the second largest river in the world next to the Amazon with very large water resource. And a lot of that power would be pumped south to South Africa. But at the same time, they have quite a number of coal-fired power plants. And interestingly enough, the British financial interests have seen that the, well, those plants are starved, so we can't get them really in operation. We can't put the emission controls on, et cetera. But we need to have an extensive 15,000-mile uh, transmission line for electricity. And we also need to pump water north from the Congo River Basin into Lake Chad to the north and then to the east into the upper White Nile River so we would have plenty of water for Sudan and South Sudan and this disastrous political stunt of creating a country in South Sudan that's just created nothing but a war needs to be corrected. And then, of course, water would also go to the east and south into Mozambique and Tanzania and Zambia and so forth, as well as Botswana. And then we would have a water, electricity, and rail infrastructure program. Is that the last one? It is. Well, I thank you very much, and uh, I hope this gives you at least a summary overview of, of some of the infrastructure programs that could be developed with worldwide significance centered on the Bering Strait Tunnel and the Daring Gap. Thank you.